about IA. Uh, uh, Javier, please have the floor. Oh, you are muted. Sorry, <laughs> now, yeah. Uh, yeah, today I'm going to talk about this new code uh, called INC that we have developed at Lawrence Livermore to do density functional theory calculations. Um, okay. So, uh, well, probably don't need to talk much about density functional theory to in this, this uh, environment, but um, essentially it's a computational attractive way to do quantum simulations. And it's a very important uh, application. And it's estimated that around 15% of the supercomputing time in the world is spent in BFT calculation. So it's a very important application. And as such, there are a lot of different DFT codes. Most of them were developed around 20 years ago when they're um, in general quite large codes uh, with a lot of legacy. And it's hard for this code to obtain good performance in modern um, architectures in particular in GPUs because um, uh, languages and everything has evolved and you have a very large large code that you have to adapt and this is not as easy thing to do. In this context, we decided um, we got some funding from DOE to, to develop, um, to do TDFT calculations in particular. And we decided that if we wanted to target GPU supercomputers, which is one of the things you ask us, it was better to start from scratch, uh, to start applying a new idea from scratch instead of just um, taking an existing code and trying to make it run on GPUs. And this was around two years ago. So, and then the main question is, okay, why do we want Get an RDFT code when there are plenty of codes around. Uh, the main reason is if we want to do implement GPU support, we need, uh, in general, you need extensive modification. It's not that you can just say, okay, I change a few functions and now I have GPU support. In general, um, you need to do a, uh, you need to do a lot of work and, and touch a lot of the code. So it's not something easy to do, and in this sense, uh, the work. It's, uh, you have to do it anyway, in a sense. Um, and we decided, okay, if we are going, we can start this and we apply uh, new ideas in, in in code development that were not available some time ago, and that would allow us to write code fast and um, and in a proper way. So, in principle. Uh, so we use modern C++, uh, we use the modern ideas in C++ templates and all of these, these concepts. And also e developing techniques like um, agile and, and good testing and modularity. So we can have a code that is very compact and, and easy to develop and we can do development fast. Uh, so this is well how Inc was born and uh, we, what we obtain is a, a, a very clean design for the code, and that is only around 12,000 lines, um, which for comparison, typical DFT codes have several hundred thousands of lines of code. And QWall, for example, that is a kind of basic uh, DFT code has around 70,000 lines. So we consider this a big success. We can write very compact code um, and a very simple code that is easy to maintain, but still has all the features and all the performance. We wrote it from scratch to run on GPUs and MPI, so everything is well distributed and, and GPU support is there from, from the very beginning. We do extensive testing. Um, there are around 6,000 lines of testing of, of code, of tests of the code. So. Um, and it's also ex an extra like 50% of the things we write as it's, it's testing. So one, a third of the what we write. And it's a modular and excess implementation. The idea is not to have something, a big monolithic code, but something that is easy to extend and implement the new features. In terms of the physics that INC does, it's a very standard uh, DFT code. Um, 
the idea, it's just plane waves as a little potential, the same idea behind many, many other uh, codes. And we use fairly standard algorithms. The idea is we are innovating in the way we write the code. We want to not start also implementing different things. And since it's very modular, the idea is we can later go and change and, and change things with the way we do things uh, in components and not having to modify the whole code. It's, uh, it does ground state DFT, also does real time GDFT, which is kind of for main objective for a moment. And your standard semi local functions in DFT. But our, our objective is to have fast hybrid functions as well. And well, just to show you, we validated the code to make sure that it gives the proper results. And we have found that it gives the same. Um, it gives the same results as Quantum Espresso or Octopus for ground state and real time TDFT simulation. So we are sure that the code is, is working properly and does the physics the way it should. So um, one of the first things we decided was to make this code highly modular um, because we don't really want to to have uh, implement everything. And the things we implement, we want to implement that in individual components with well-defined tasks that we can, um, that can be shared among codes and can be, um, uh, and can be developed independently. So um, Inc is the code that does the, the DFT, um, DFT simulations. And it's built on top of other libraries that are in, we develop or um, or we use externally. For example, we use the so we have a library for um, a C plus plus MPI interface, um, and also we have a, a library called Multi for multidimensional arrays that does all the part of abstracting um, well the, the arrays and also abstracting uh, operations like in algebra or fast Fourier transforms. And this is something that I think Alfredo Correa will talk uh, today in the afternoon. So um, you can find more information about this in, in his talk. Then um, another thing we identify could be separated is this pseudo potential parsing that is the process of taking a pseudo potential file and extracting information that is can be used in the code. This is a very, uh, well, I will talk about a second about it, but this is another library that we, um, we that's another task we identified, okay, this is a, can be done in a library independent of the encode. And uh, for example, we also use libxc, that is a library of configuration functionals, that this is, of course, exists as, uh, since a long time. I was, uh, have been in, um, involved in this development a bit. Uh, but this is essentially external library, but it, this is the, the library that does exchange correlation functions. Um, and we don't really have to worry about that, just use the, the library that already exists. We don't re need to reinvent the wheel in that sense. So as I mentioned, Pseudopod, it's a library for um, parsing cell potential files. Uh, probably you know that pseudo potentials are a big mess in terms of there are a lot of formats and a lot of different Essentially, each code has its own, its own format. We didn't want to add a new one. So what we did is um, write some code that can parse these pseudo potential libraries, uh, these pseudo potential files. And also, um, so that can be called from the code. And the code, the only thing it receives is a, like a, an array, if you want, or a, or a spline, or some interpolation function where you can ask, OK, give me the pseudo potential in this in this point, all the, the associated quantities. Um, we can also, uh, this library also take care of distributing and managing pseudo potential sets. Recently, people have started to make sets for like the whole periodic table or a large number of elements together. Um, and the idea is pseudopod can take care of that. So you can say to pseudopod, okay, I want this. Uh, for example, let's take the SG15 set, give me the silver potential, let's use that set, and now give me silver potential for hydrogen, oxygen, and carbon, for example. And 
uh, pseudopod will do that, so you don't have to really worry about okay where are the where are these coming from or how, where where are the files coming from and everything. And um, part of and these files will come with the library. So essentially, in the most basic stuff, you can just ask pseudopod okay I need a pseudopotential for carbon, just give me that. Um, it can also do pseudopotential filtering. That is about it's a technique especially useful for real space code where you remove high high, uh, uh, high frequency Fourier components, something you cannot represent when you're working on a grid, for example. Um, and this is something that pseudopod can do for you, so you don't need to worry about this. You just specify, okay, this is my maximum G or maximum spacing I, I want, and so pseudopod will do the filtering for you. And it's also GPU compatible in the sense um, these calculations are not very expensive, or so the parsing is not very expensive, you don't need to do that. But the idea is you can pass your own containers that are on the GPU, and, and um, Pseudopod will give you data that is already in the GPU, and so you can call it the functions that give you the values, you can call them from the GPU. So, um, Something we have done also in, in the um, one approach we use in, for developing a thing is what is called agile development. And the idea, um, the idea, the basic idea is we want to, um, we don't really work in like a, a thing where we decide, okay, this is, this is the design of the code. And this is what the parts we're going to do. And like, okay, let's code for three months and then we get everything together and check if it works or not. But instead we work in small tasks and say, okay, yeah, let's let's start from the very basic. What is the smallest thing we can do that is useful? We can test and, and we can work. And we work in this incremental way. We try to have things that work that are easy to test and that we start implementing additional functionality starting from this idea. This allows us to well, test easily, make sure we are working on solid ground. And also because as you develop things, you realize, okay, things should not, I mean, these are the best way of doing things. So there are different ways of doing things. And we can, um, we figure out how to do those things on the fly. If you just decide, okay, we are make a committee and decide what the code is going to do. On the process, you discover, okay, yeah, these things are not really, I mean, this is not the best way of doing things, but you have spent a lot of time trying to uh, working on that thing that at the end you figure out that it doesn't work. So this is a very, um, a way that allows us to develop code much faster. Um, it reduces a lot the time of in debugging too. So it's a very um, efficient way of, of doing things and allows us to do a lot of, of development. And continuing with the idea, this idea, in general, probably everybody, I mean, if you have done code development, you realize that debugging consumes a lot of time. And many times it's like, you can spend one afternoon writing the code and then spend two weeks debugging it. So um, we, uh, we, you want to develop things in a way that you have to sp want to do the less debugging as possible. Um, so the way we do this is what's called test-driven design. We write a lot of tests. As I mentioned before, like for 12,000 lines of code, we have 6,000 lines of tests. Um, so we write the test together with the code. Each small part uh, of the code we write, we do tests and test it. Like we make sure it's working the way it should for the specific cases, corner cases and everything. And once we have this building block that we know is, is working properly, we can test, we can, uh, we can use it and, and we know, okay, yeah, this is, is working properly when we were on solid ground. Um, and these are well called unit tests. So we test each part independently. And also we make large tests, integration tests. Typically we test different systems and have to make sure that the code is working uh, properly and um, we validate this test, for example, with other codes and stuff like that, and we make sure we don't break things as the development goes. And these tests are integrated into the development. Um, each time we make a change, we, we, we test, run the test, and make sure that 
everything is it's working and if we don't accept uh, merge requests if something is um, fails and we also check the coverage to make sure that every all the features are being tested so uh, the other advantage is we are making uh, we are using C++ modern C++ uh, maybe Alfredo will talk a bit more about this he's the kind of the expert on this um, but we use C++ and all the features to make code that is simple to understand uh, and to write. For example, this is a natural line you may see in the code that um, when we want to apply the, apply the Hamiltonian, we simply have a, have a function called Hamiltonian that only takes one argument that is the, the, the orbitals we want to apply the Hamiltonian, for example, and you get the result, it returns a result. Um, so this is a very simple syntax that allows you to write very compact code, very simple code, and very easy to understand. You don't have to pass 10 arguments on a Hamiltonian function, for example. And the good thing is with modern C++, you don't get any performance penalty for doing these things. There are no superfluous copies or any, any, other, um, any other type of, of um, negative um, uh, performance. The performance is not impacted by this. So this, this is one of the reasons we can do, we can have a very compact code, only 12,000 lines for full DFT implementation, because we can have very simple syntax. And I think we also want to change the, the paradigm of how we do things. Um, this is a bit similar, for example, what we saw with whom the other people is doing. Um, the idea is that the traditional, the traditional way usually the current tractor code works is you have a code written in some language like Fortran, C, C++, that does most of the work. And then you have some sort of input file format, um, typically some arbitrary format where people write, um, write their input files. And these days, since these computations are relatively cheap, most people don't do one, just one simulation and then they end up writing a bash or python script on top that modifies and creates input files and has to parse outputs um, to run the, the, the actual calculations so in the sense you end up having three languages because sometimes you need to implement for example something that the code doesn't have so you say okay yeah i, well, I will have to modify the code and then yeah, you end up having to learn three different languages uh, to do things. Um, and usually parsing outputs are this very complicated and very arduous and stuff. The idea of Ink is Ink is really a C++ library where um, that is written in C++ and the Ink programs are also written in C++. So it provides an interface that looks like a, like um, an input file uh, from a DFT code. And users can uh, link with other libraries, for example, if you want to do machine learning or like uh, you want to connect to Nvidia's projects or anything, you can call, you can integrate other type of C++ libraries. But also you have a continuum and you can go and, and work directly and you, for example, you get your results, your data directly in a C++ um, uh, data structure, and you don't really have to worry about parsing files and stuff like that. And for example, this is an example of an, uh, an ink input file where we have, um, this is to show you how you do calculations, so you define a distance, uh, you have, like, you create a standard container with the, with the atoms, and then you create a system of ions, uh, so you create the ions, this you create the electrons. These are all C++ objects. And then you ask, OK, I want the result for this. And um, just you call the refraction that calculates the ground state, passing as arguments the ions, electrons. And for example, if you want to say, I want PD as interaction. And then you will get a result object. Um, and you can get the energy from here. Um, so this is the idea. We think it's. It's not very complicated to use, but it's very powerful because you can do a lot of things. You can put loops here and do a lot of things that will take a lot of effort to do. In, if you have to interface 
uh, an input file format and some sort of scripting language. And one of the, the, the main objectives of Zinc is, is to run on GPUs because uh, it's something that is fundamental today for scientific codes. Most uh, supercomputers are um, GPU based these days and we need, um, so we need, uh, we need to have this GPU support if we want to, to run on these machines and do large scale calculations. To do this on Inc, um, we take an, like, uh, an everything on the GPU approach, uh, opposed to a floating. Some codes you can get away where, where you run on one, just one routine, you can do some floating where you were like, oh, okay, yeah, I will, hide behind the scenes, I'm going to call this library data is copied to the GPU and run on GPU. You cannot really do that for DFT. And the main reason is we want to avoid the slow copies of memory from GPU to GPU. But this means we need to run everything on, on the GPU, otherwise we get terrible performance. Um, and the other important thing is we're using managed memory, which is memory that can be um, can be read from both the CPU and the GPU. Um, of course, for performance, we still need to run everything on the GPU. So it's not that we do this because um, we have things running on the GPU, but it a uh, helps a lot, makes the code much simpler. And especially when we have tests, for example, we want to access the data directly from the CPU and we don't want to, to write to copy a specific copy routine. So managed memory allows us to, to do this very efficiently and and it's very simple. It has the other advantage that also it's easier to manage the memory in the GPU. So if you overcommit the GPU, you will not get an error like we are out of memory. You just get the performance, uh, an impact on performance. That makes it much simpler. And of course, uh, as you probably know, um, we have today we have like three different vendors that produce uh, GPUs, and they all have their own different language. Um, so this is a mess because we don't really want to, to, to support all, all the code and write different code for each um, for each library. And that defeats the whole purpose. So we have a, a, some, like a thin layer that is GPU agnostic. It's not something complicated like Cocos or Raya or something. Um, and there are two parts of this. One is multi, this multi-array library that I mentioned before where uh, that takes care, for example, the allocations um, uh, and the copies, transposition, all these kind of operations. Those are done by, by multi because essentially with the only data structure we use are, are arrays, is multi-dimensional arrays, and multi allows you to have that allocated on the GPU easily. So we don't have, really have to worry about that part. And also take care of GPU accelerated libraries, for example, like um, BLAST or FFTs. So this part, and this is the part that usually spends most of the time in a playing with TFT code. So we have this part covered. The other part is that we still have a lot of different kernels, that custom kernels that are not really represented by a BLAST or, or other kind of library. So we still have to, uh, to, to run that, to, to have a way of writing specific uh, kernels. Many of these are not really critical for performance, but they are like, but you really need to run them on the CPU on the GPU, sorry. And also the other task we need to do with our reductions. So we, 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 uh, where we have like a lot of, we have data and we need to do a sum, for example, and it's data on the GPU. And this is something that there is no easy way of doing it, no, no simple library to do this. So, um, and for that, we created this very thin uh, idea of what we call GPU run, that is a very simple way of running kernels that is abstracted from the lower level. And, um, and it's much simpler to write, a, for example, calling a CUDA kernel. CUDA is a bit tricky to call because you have to write a separate kernel and call it and something. So you end up writing a lot of code just to, to, to run CUDA. So this is something that sits on top of CUDA and allows us to run it. Uh, run simple kernels. And of course, right now we support CUDA, but the idea is we will support other APIs uh, from AMD and Intel in the future. And then changes we will have to do are minimal and don't really need to change ink to really change ink. 
And this is an example of this GPU run function I was mentioning. For example, let's say we want to sum two matrices. This is what you would do normally in a loop. Uh, instead, uh, and of course, this only works on the CPU. In the GPU, this has to be done in parallel. So what we do is this GPU run function that essentially it's, you, you, it works like some sort of loop. We say, OK, we want to run uh, two loops that will go to a, a size m and n. And then we pass a lambda function that is what is going to be compiled for the GPU. And this lambda function receives as argument the, the indices of, of the array. Um, it's something very simple, but it's very powerful and, and allows us to run um, code on GPU on very, in very few lines of code and very, uh, very simple level of abstraction. Still, we have found some uh, big challenges for running on GPU, uh, specifically in GPU with MPI. Um, when we run on a single, like uh, on a single GPU on a single node, this is the, we can run very efficiently. But when we want to run with MPI, there are um, a lot of challenges and things that are still not available. In particular, um, GPU accelerated. Uh, parallel libraries. For example, we want to do um, linear algebra, and for this, um, well, you would use like Kubelas or something, but or if you're on CPU and MPI, you use Scala pack. When you want to mix the two GPUs, uh, there is one library that's been developed in the in development called Slate, uh, coming from the Ongara group, but this library is still in development and, and there are still parts missing for this. Um, so for the moment, we don't really have a good alternative to do GPU and MPI um, linear algebra. Same with FFTs. Um, there are some libraries that do parallel FFTs with GPUs, but they are like limited in functionality. So this is something we, we are facing right now, and we hope it will be fixed in the near future. And of course, in general, we have the problem that the communication, the relative cost of communication becomes more expensive when you are running in GPUs. Still, uh, yeah, it's uh, 27 minutes. Okay, yeah, I will. I have two more slides only. Uh, so, um, still, we get good performance in, in, uh, in the parallelization. This is um, the parallel speed that we get with a system of a thousand atoms. And we can scale um, with fairly reasonable um, performance, very close to the idea of performance, up to 128 GPUs. And we can go all the way up to 1,000 GPUs, still gaining some performance. So even with these limitations in the parallelization, we can get good, good scale up, uh, with performance. Good parallel performance on, on GPUs. So we're kind of high, happy about this. And of course, we're working to try and close this gap, in particular with the, the FFT parallelization in, in GPUs. So, in conclusion, uh, I hope I convinced you this is not your standard electronic tracker code. We are doing things very differently in some sense. Um, we're exploring all these alternatives. And we think it's a code ready for the future, but we, it can be adapted to to modern architectures and new ideas, uh, also new physics. Um, everything, it's, we are, it's a work in progress. We're not, we don't have anything set on stone. And one of the points is we, we realize software evolves and we are willing to change and, and improve things in our, our parts. Um, we have our first paper available here's the archive. Uh, it's already published in JCTC as well. Um, I should put that, that link. Um, and finally, I want to say it's a code that it's, the idea is to have something that is community driven that people can contribute. It's released under a free software license. Uh, and all the development is done openly on GitLab. You can go there and see how it's development. You can send my requests and everything. And we are very happy to have contributions. And with that, I finish. Thank you all for your attention.
Thank you. So we probably have time for one quick question. Anyone raise hands? I haven't seen. There's some th thumb ups. Thanks. Uh, okay. No one else. Uh, I I can add one. So I, mean, I think for has a question, no? Oh, oh, he changed before he was doing thumb up. So that too. <laughs> oh, okay. oh. Yeah. No. Um. Thanks. That, that's that's um. Uh, nice work. So you do everything in GPU, you say. Um, yes. And uh, so, so that that so then I have two questions um, about that. So um, first, what about ifs? So you you will have some ifs and other other, other statements that don't mesh well with GPUs at some point. So does that pose does that pose a problem, or is that simply not performance relevant? Uh, not really. I mean, uh, of course, depends. We try to avoid ifs as much as possible. Mm -hmm. uh, in general, you can, I mean, especially in like inner loops and stuff like that. Um, so we don't really have an issue with that. But uh, many times it's just, uh, if you have something that's not critical for performance, you don't worry too much about having an if. Um, sometimes it's just you need to run a GPU because you don't want to copy the data to the CPU, so yeah. Um, so yeah, we don't. I mean, at the moment, we don't really have anything that we have said. Oh, this kernel is not very is very inefficient or something. So. Right. And, and so the, Volker, do you mean um, if like where to run stuff all the no, time? No, like, no, I think I if, think Javier. Javier. Um, Answer, answer that question, I think. Yeah. So that's, that's, that's okay. good. Yeah. And uh, the, the other question I have then is, so if you, if you have a framework that can do all this, then you also have a generic framework, or you would in principle have a generic framework that can run all sorts of stuff on the three different architectures, right? So this isn't, I mean, you can, you can use it for TDFT or TDDFT, but how general is the framework underneath? Can it be used for, for something else? Yeah. Yeah, it's very general. It's not something that really it's associated to anything. The only it's it's just a simple thing that abstracts the loops essentially. Thanks. Uh, Edmund has a question in the middle of the group. I think you're muted, Edmund. Okay, as we are waiting for Ed, Edmond, so I, I just have a quick question. So do you use the GPU feature from, from LibXC? Use a GPU part from an external library? I thought this is- uh, Yeah, actually I wrote the, I put like GPU support in LibXC. So okay, the, that makes sense. You saw- so Yeah, it. actually that was in, it's integrated in the main branch now of, of yeah. LibXC. Edmond, are you able to say something? Uh, How's yeah. the sound now? It's good now. Yeah. Okay. Um, sorry about that. Thanks for the talk. I was going to say that I've also been very interested in uh, linear algebra operations on GPUs across nodes. And uh, for distributed eigenvalue problems, we've been finding that ELPA is really hard to beat. So that is uh, wow. what we're doing now. Um, yeah, it yeah. Is, uh, so on C yeah, both yeah, on CPUs know. and on GPUs, on CPUs, um, it's better than ELPA consistently. Sorry, it's better than Scala Pack consistently, mm -hmm. and uh, and it has the capability on GPUs, which uh, Scala Pack. Yeah, yeah, it's a bit tricky because I mean it's something we're considering because essentially that's a functionality missing from Slate at the moment. Yeah, so Slate just announced last week at a review meeting that uh, they finished their eigenvalue code. And uh, I asked them whether it is a GPU resident or what, what ex performance they expect relative to ELPA. And they said that uh, it is not GPU resident. In other words, it's accelerated like ELPA, 
you have to copy some things back to the CPU, um, which might be the best choice, uh, design choice um, for performance ne nevertheless. And it sounds like that their implementation strategy was very similar to that of ELPA's. So they would expect similar performance. Yeah. Yeah, we are kind of using, uh, I mean, one alternative we have is use both Slate and uh, ELPA, but it's a bit tricky. The problem ELPA, it only works in square matrices, for example, more from matrix multiplications. Uh, yeah. So sorry. that's a big limitation for us. So that's why we can just, we thought at the beginning, okay, we just do ELPA, but we have this limitation. So we have to use a combination of all, or wait for Slate to do the. Yeah, so Slate would. Excuse me, I have to cut here because uh, oh. to the time of, the discussion we have to do, the group discussion. Okay. Oh.